Hi. So I just found out my name means carpet in Swedish, and I'm still trying to grapple with that. I hope nobody here is really confused about what's going on right now. <laughs> um, so I don't have too much time. I'm going to set a timer so I don't go over it, and then we'll cut the bullshit and just go into, you know, how to teach yourself to code and why I think it's important. So, go. Um, all right, so three parts of this talk. Why, what, and how. Why? Why stop waiting and start learning how to code? For me, it started with an idea. I was a marketer three years ago. I had never touched a line of code. I didn't study computer science. I studied finance. And I studied finance at a time where when I graduated, it was impossible to find a job. So I kind of screwed myself in that sense. So I had this idea, though, as a marketer at a startup. And this idea was for this product that I really, really thought needed to exist. It was like a billion dollar idea, of course. And the thing I was angry about was that I couldn't find a developer to build it for me. Right? And I'd been trained watching the social network and you know, just people around me of people saying like, well, you need to find a developer to make this thing actually happen. Right? You're not smart enough. You need like the Mark Zuckerberg guy to actually bring this into reality. And I was grabbing coffee with a, a mentor of mine five months after trying to find this person. I couldn't find it. And he said, if you're expecting to find someone to make your idea actually happen, to build that idea for you, that's never going to happen. Right? Um, the idea is that as an entrepreneur, you have to actually execute despite not having the resources, despite not having the money or the people or a market or really any support ever, right? And demand for developers, as we probably all know, has skyrocketed, right? Right now, anyone with any development talent is getting offers from Google, Facebook, dozens of other startups like at this very moment. The, the average salary in Silicon Valley for developers is like $150,000 plus right out of college. It's kind of crazy at this point. And it's because coders are like, kind of like modern day artists, the way I think about it. Um, you can take something that is just it is ephemeral, that's nothing, and make it a reality. I've always admired how an artist could like, see something and then paint it and show the rest of the world how they see the world. And I think coders do that in a lot of ways. You could come up with an idea and then you know, spend three days at your computer over the weekend, and suddenly everyone has access to this idea. And I was reading a post on Quora by Dennis Crowley about like, what are the most valuable skills that an entrepreneur can have. And number one was to be able to code, to be able to build a prototype. He says, I went through three to four years thinking that I would find that magical engineer who would build all the stuff I was thinking about, but I never met that person. Right? Three to four years. And this is before like, the current craze of, of everyone trying to find developers. So he actually picked up a book, and he learned Microsoft Access, which for any of you guys who know, it's like horrible. And he started hacking Foursquare, or what would eventually become Foursquare. And he still admits he's a shitty programmer, but he could build a prototype. And that's the idea, is that learning how to code is not the same as being a software engineer. I'm not saying you guys should all be software engineers. Right? We all have you know, jobs where we focus on, and a lot of them are not necessarily you know, technical, and you don't necessarily need to be able to build all this stuff on a daily basis. But the point is to be able to code well enough to build a prototype. Uh, in the startup world, we talk about minimum viable products. Right? A prototype, to give you an example, is this. Does anyone recognize this? This is Twitter. Right? That was Twitter's first logo. It doesn't even have any vowels in it. It's barely recognizable, but this is how they first launched. And they first launched as a prototype where it was all over text message. Right? It looks nothing like what we see today, and it's very easy for us to confuse the way the products are now with how they were when they first launched. People often come to me and say, I have this full idea of this thing I want to build. How do I do it? But the question is, like, how do you not build version 1,000? How do you build version 0.1? Right? <laughs> Another example, this is Craigslist. This is how it looks today. Right? In some cases, you never really move past the prototype. And that's fine, because Craigslist is six people, and they're making over $100 million a year. And then finally, I think the most important reason to learn how to code, why all of us should learn how to code, is that more and more, everything that we interact with in the world around us is technology. Right? We have cameras, we have computers in our cars, in our pockets. By a show of hands, how many people here sleep with their phones within arm's distance? <laughs> right? How many people take their phone into the bathroom with them? 
look around. Don't trust any of these people with their phones. That's gross. <laughs> um, there's this joke that there are 10 kinds of people in the world. Those who understand binary and those who don't. But on a more serious note, society is actually very quickly dividing into two groups of people. You have those that know how to code, and they can manipulate the very structure of the world around them, and then you have those that don't. And their lives are being designed and directed by the people that do. There's a great book on this topic called Program or Be Programmed by Doug Rushkoff that I'd recommend reading if you're curious about learning more. Okay, so that's part one. Part two, what? Okay, so like, let's assume that we take for granted learning to code is valuable. That still doesn't really tell you what you actually have to do, and that's the most confusing part. So how do you choose a programming language? How do you actually get started? I know that for me, the biggest problem, the biggest reason I never actually jumped into it was that there are so many fucking terms out there, and you don't know which one to start with, right? You could spend, all, you could spend your whole lifetime trying to figure out what all these things mean on Wikipedia, and it's not very helpful for that. So I want to break down uh, web applications, which is how most of us interact with code these days. Web applications are applications that you access over the internet. They're like any other application, like on your phone, or like Microsoft Word, or Excel, or, or Keynote, except that you go to a website. So Twitter is an application. Facebook is an application. Every application has two parts, a front end and a back end. The front end is what you see. This is what most of us interact with every day. Uh, there's really only th there's three front-end languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You've probably heard all of these three. They all come together to create the pages you look at. Uh, my co-founder has a, a way of thinking of this. He likes to say the HTML and the sentence are the nouns. Those are the things. The CSS are the adjectives, the way things look. And the JavaScript is the verbs, the way things behave. So they all come together to be like, you know, that's what you're seeing, that's how it looks, and that's how it behaves. But then there's the back end, and the back end is the most confusing part because we don't see it every day, and it's like a black box, like what's actually going on? And a simple way of, of thinking about it is you have a database, which is where you store everything, all of your information. If you've ever opened up Excel or a spreadsheet, then it's basically the exact same thing, right? It just can hold millions and millions of records. And then you have the rules in between that will say, you know, I open up a Twitter page, I want to get this person's tweets and all their information, and then show it to you on that page. Now, in terms of languages, the rules, these are what we're thinking about when we think of programming languages. Four big ones are PHP, uh, Ruby, Python, Java, C is another one. There's like hundreds of programming languages, but those are the four big ones. And then on the database level, there's really only one. It's called SQL. People often ask me, I have this idea. I'm trying to build it. What language should I learn? And I always think it's, uh, you know, but now that I know, I want to explain to them, it's, it's a silly question. It's like asking, you know, I have this story I want to tell. Should I tell it in English or in Chinese or, you know, in Swedish? Like, you could tell the same story in all of these languages, right? They have differences. Some languages you have to remember if a word is male or female, which I've always hated. Uh, some have different tenses. And programming languages are kind of the same. This is an example of three lines of code in each language, and they look different, like the actual function name or, or whether they have semicolons at the end, but at the end of the day, they all say, hello world, right? Now, there's one new thing this has come about in the last few years and become really popular. These are called web application frameworks, and these are these sort of, they do the whole thing, right? Web application frameworks, you probably have heard of WordPress. That's a really big, famous one. And what that does is it helps you build a blog really quickly without knowing too much about code. The two more modern ones are Ruby on Rails and Django. These are usually built in another language. Ruby on Rails is built in Ruby. Django is built in Python. WordPress is actually built in PHP, right? and it's much older. There's this crazy definition, but basically they help you build web applications really quickly. Uh, Twitter was built in Ruby on Rails in a very short amount of time. N we have these hackathons now. The reason why these are big and popular all of a sudden is because these web application frameworks let you build things in like two days, whereas five or 10 years ago, it would take a team of 20 people and two years to build something. You can actually build an entire thing by yourself now. So my advice to you is this. If you want to learn to build a prototype, learn Ruby on Rails. Also, Rails for short. Rails is the easiest to dive into, for one, because it has a really huge community, a lot of resources for beginners out there. 
number one. Number two, it hides a lot of the stuff that you don't really need to know. That's kind of the philosophy going into it, is that unless you really need to do this customization, you don't have to worry about it. For example, you don't have to learn any, any SQL, any of the database stuff, if you're dealing with Rails. There's a lot of shortcuts for the front end stuff, so you don't have to learn as much CSS or HTML or really any JavaScript when you're getting started, and you can do the whole thing. Uh, for example, here's one command you run on the left, just when you're first creating an application, Rails new application, and it does all of these things on the right. It basically sets up the structure of your application. You're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, of people who figured this out before you, so you don't have to learn it all yourself again. So that you can do stuff like this, which is a video, it's really cool watch, by the creator of Ruby on Rails, David Heinemeyer Hansen, and he shows people how to build uh, how to build WordPress in 15 minutes. This was when he first unveiled Ruby on Rails, and it, it, like the community was up in arms about it because people who had been coding for 20 years were like, he's using all these cheats and shortcuts, and it's like not real coding. But that's kind of the point, is that he built all these cheats and shortcuts that we can now use, right? OK, part three, how? Teaching yourself to code in a month. I hate learning. I'll put that out there. I run an education company, so it's tough. Actually, I don't hate learning. I hate studying. Right? I hate reading books. I hate note cards. I hate sitting in a classroom and just people droning on. I like learning if I can do it in an enjoyable way. So when I was in college, I developed something that I call brute force learning, which is basically a hack for how to get around studying. And it was right around the time iTunes University came, first came out, which was so cool. Like They had all these podcasts of classes from Stanford and Berkeley and, and like for free online. We forget about iTunes University, right? We think about all the, the MOOCs and stuff now, but like this was kind of the first. And I realized that they had the classes I was taking at NYU, but from like Berkeley and Stanford. So I had the idea that if meditation or like hypnosis tapes that you can listen to while you're sleeping work, then maybe I can like hypnotize myself by listening to these things without actually having to think about them. So I would download them and listen to them while I was walking around the city or on the subway or just kind of wherever. Instead of active studying, I was like passively studying. And it ended up actually working and eliminating hundreds of hours of studying that I would have had to do, right? And if I didn't get it the first time, it was like not a worry. I could just go back and, and listen to the same class by some other teacher who maybe had a different way of explaining the same thing. It also, teachers love the unique perspectives I was able to bring in to the class because, you know, all these smart teachers would have like really interesting things to say. And I'd be right, of course, because I got it from someone else. So why does this work? Right? Like I mentioned, a lot of the things that we know about learning are wrong. It turns out that we think we should fully understand a concept before moving on to the next one. That's not a, a good way to learn. Usually, and this is the way I think about it, the first time you learn something, your brain is creating this fuzzy mental picture of all of the things that are going on, right? And you need to have a full understanding. Like, where are we going to get? This is why I hear a lot of complaints of people who like, start trying to learn to code, and they start with Code Academy or something that dives right into the details, is that they don't get the big picture of how that's actually going to help them build something, right? Once you do that, though, when you go back, and relearn the basics, it starts to make more sense. I think of having hooks that you, know, you can then attach concepts to further along the way. So the advice that I have, and this is what I did, was I just sped through as many introductory tutorials as possible. And don't stop just because you're confused by something, because that's usually when people give up. And they're well-intentioned. You know, they say, I don't want to move on until I really get this. But that's usually where people like, get distracted and then stop. right? So I have a few resources to, to point your direction. And this is what I really wanted to know when I was coding, was like, where do I start? Which ones are good or bad? The first one I took was the uh, Ruby on Rails essential training at lynda.com. Lynda costs money. It's like $10 a month. I think they offer a seven-day free trial. I finished this in seven days. It's awesome. It's like 10 hours of video. So you could just power through it. The next one I checked out was the Ruby on Rails tutorial by Michael Hartle, and this one's free, and it's kind of the holy grail for coding online. Right? I was able to get through this in about a week and a half. So let's say one week, two and a half weeks, you're in. I do everything in a month, so obviously I had to do that. And by the end of this, you have actually built from scratch this application that I see right there. Does anyone kind of recognize what this application is? Like, shout it out if you hear it. Twitter, exactly. So you've built Twitter from scratch two and a half weeks in, which is pretty cool. 
And it's exactly that kind of cool feeling where you just hit enter and this is working and you could show your friends that keeps people motivated rather than just building like sort of boring programs that loop over numbers. Then, once you've actually built the, f the structure of it, there's a great site called Railscasts that will show you the features of like how to add Twitter integration or Facebook integration or maps or like he has hundreds of videos, they're all five to 10 minutes each. Troubleshooting, that's a tough one, right? Fortunately, we don't see the screen anymore. Uh, we just see the spinning wheel of death if you have a Mac. I wanna say 75% of coding is Googling. This was something that surprised me when I first started. I had this, this idea of a coder who could go off by, by himself, knew it all, could like write it all out without having to ask anyone. That's not the case. Even people who've been doing this for 20 years are using Google every day, five or 10 times a day. The real value is to be able to know where to go, right, and to know what to look for. Uh, there's one site called Stack Overflow that you'll end up on a lot, and it's basically a, a forum where people can ask questions, and then you see answers, and there's a little checkbox so you know that's the right answer. That's quite cool. And then finally, asking someone. That's like what I always had as the as a sort of the final option, right? Um, there are meetups in every major city around coding. The, the Ruby community, like I mentioned, is large, and people are super supportive, like surprisingly supportive. People want to help beginners. That's why there are so many resources out there. So the first thing I did was I found like five meetups, and I'd have one to go to each night. So if I ran into a problem, I could you know, get the problem 24 hours later, or the solution to it. Um, that's it. I want to pose the question, now what? As an educator, right, it's, it's not just about teaching someone something, it's about instilling the next steps. And if you just come out of this with at least one thing you learned, that's pretty cool. But it would be even cooler if you come out of it with one resource you want to check out. So hopefully one of those stuck with you. And if it didn't, you can email me and I'll send it to you. Um, I want to say thank you. I'm Matan at OneMonth.com, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about coding, my experience, and uh, yeah. You've been awesome.